Oh, hey. Thanks for joining me. My name's Tom, Motor Resto LLC here in Bradenton, Florida. And I'm restarting a channel that I used to have on YouTube by the same name, doing the same thing. And I wanted to put my first video up and do a quick introduction and show you what I'm working on. Um, I uh, deleted that entire channel a number of months ago for a variety of personal reasons, which I won't get into here, but that's behind me now. And so it's time to maybe move forward and uh, start it up again. So I, what I, I just wanted to explain for people that don't know me what I do. I work on uh, antique, um, well, technically antique, if you go off of different state requirements for tags and things like that, motorcycles. Um, I'll do some ATV work even on some newer ones as long as they're carbureted. So I pretty much work on everything, but my specialty is in the, the old Japanese uh, motorcycles, the KZ 1000s, you know, even small ones. And so, you know, I, I do that kind of stuff. Uh, antique vintage, you know, uh, which, which a lot of shops, pretty much all of them and dealerships don't want to even touch anymore. So that's where the crux or the, the majority of my workflow comes from. So that's what I do and that's what I'm going to do is on this channel is put up some videos about what I'm working on. Uh, the idea of restarting a channel springboarded um, as a result of getting this one in, which we'll go over here in a minute. And for all you Kawasaki aficionados, you will recognize this as a uh, 1978 KZ1000 Z1R. We're going to go over the spike and the purpose of this video besides introduction is to see how it runs, if it runs. And then um, we're going we're gonna to do a couple other things to it, uh, which I'll explain as we go along. But I'm going to do a walk around on the bike real quick. We'll talk about the model. We'll talk about the um, actual the genesis of it, if you will, uh, the history. And, uh, and then we'll move on with some actual nuts and bolts stuff. So enjoy the ride. Hopefully this is going to be one of a series of videos on this bike uh, with some other work probably intermixed in there. Certainly won't put any weed whacker videos up or anything like that, but if it's motorcycle or interesting related, I'll do that. So with that, let's get to it. And again, thanks for joining me. All right, so this is the plan. And let me tell you what the customer wants. Customer wants this bike ultimately to be a full restoration. I don't know if I'll do a, an entire restoration on this or it'll be farmed out to different other you know, sources. But my job at this point is to do an evaluation of it, a basic evaluation. He said when he bought it, it did run, but not well. That was a while ago. I remember when he picked this up, he actually ran it by in his trailer with another bike. Uh, he's got a KZ 900, or I'm sorry, a Ninja 900, the GPZ 900, which is the Tom Cruise uh, Top Gun bike too. Uh, 86, I believe, real nice bike. I'll eventually get that one. Hopefully we'll do a video on that too, but I digress, I don't wanna do that. So we're gonna do a, um, series of videos on this bike as far as just doing the basic stuff that he wants done right now. This video here, what we're going to do is we're going to get the tank off and we are going to uh, see if we can get it to run with an alternative fuel supply. I'm going to pull the spark plugs out, take a look at them, and we're going to go over a few things in regards to what I look for when I'm doing an initial evaluation on bikes like this, especially in this kind of condition. All right, so first thing also I want to do is I want to verify what I have. Now, the engine number is specific in these different uh, motorcycles, especially the more um, single year import models. And technically this is a single year model. Uh, and uh, so we wanna make sure that the engine's right. And you can see that KZT00DE Delta Echo. Um, that does um, correspond with a KZ1000-D1 or a Z1R. So this is definitely the right engine for this. The engine numbers, according to my reference here, runs, uh, let's see, it'll be um, 000101 to 017412. So uh, 101 017412. So um, that's a range. So the, the, the six digits are the engine number. So it's gonna run from 101 to 017412, that's the range. So what we have here is we have 002707. So it's pretty low in the range then, it's not you know too, too high. It's definitely matching the numbers that I got here and the reference that I have as far as it being a uh, Z1R. So we're good there, I'm confident of that. Uh, the reason, another reason why we um, were questioning that is uh, this is not supposed to have a kickstart mounted to it. It's actually got this very cute um, emergency kickstart in the seat. 
and that's uh, for kicking it over under emergency circumstances, obviously, but it's not supposed to be there all the time. So somebody has stuck a, probably a KZ1000 kickstart on there, and we don't know why, but we'll deal with that later. So again, this is definitely the right engine. Uh, I can't really see the um, frame number up here, but um, I'm confident based on the engine and what I'm looking at here that um, that it's the right one. Okay, so history of this bike. The uh, 78KZ1000Z1R is technically the first factory-produced cafe racer or a fair Japanese motorcycle ever. So this is the first, now again, that's Japanese. You know, the uh, Ducatis and perhaps uh, Guzis and other brands, I'm not really sure. And certainly people, um, you know, cobbling their own versions together beforehand existed, right? But this is the uh, first factory-produced one with a fairing, a factory-produced cafe racer. And you can go into the internet and find out all about cafe racers and doing the ton, which is a UK thing, running between two cafes uh, and, and achieving at least 100 miles an hour to beats a certain time between the two of them. That's where the term cafe racing basically comes from, depending on where you read it. So you, you can look that up yourself. So, so this is the first one that they cranked out in Japan that's designed or purpose built as a cafe racer. Now, the reason why it's a 78 is, be and there's a single year, I should say. The reason why it's a 78 is because that's when it was built. It was built in uh, 9 to 77. But the reason why it's single year, rather, is because uh, it didn't sell well. Um, the magazines really didn't like this motorcycle too much. Cycle World, Motorcyclist, Cycle Magazine, etc. They all wrote it, and they said that it's got a lot of power. It's 99 horsepower uh, motorcycle with... Um, uh, with, which did not have, in their opinion, a 99 mile, uh, horsepower rather frame and suspension setup. So they didn't like the way it handled. It had some high-speed uh, wobbles, according to them, and it just wasn't um, a great motorcycle for especially the amount of money that Kawasaki was charging them for the premium of the Z1R and being a cafe racer. So it didn't sell real well. So they discontinued it for 79, and then when they reintroduced it in 1980, it was completely different. So technically, this really is a single-year model, which makes them very, very rare. I'm not going to tell you what the customer paid for this. I do know that, but it was significant, all right? So they're a very rare bike, and it's a pleasure to actually work on it. So that's basically the history of it. That is where it comes from. That is where we have to understand where it comes from. I, I'll take that all in consideration even before I start any work at all because I, I want to know where we've been, where he wants to go customer-wise, and where this motorcycle is ultimately going to be in when we get done with it. So history is important on these things, in my opinion. So uh, as far as engine goes, I'm pretty sure this is – garden variety stock kz1000 engine i do not know if they did any like cam or intake changes i think the customer was saying they went from this the uh, i think the stock kz's had a 29 millimeter uh, uh mckinney's they went down to a 28 to change the uh, power range and and things like that which kind of makes sense because you get a little bit more low-end torque with the smaller carburetors and set depending on how it's jetted and so forth uh, this is not correct. I believe it had an air box. So this is some, you know, aftermarket, which I believe we're going to keep. We're going to keep these, not these particular ones, but we're going <laughs> to definitely not that piece of crap. Uh, we're going to keep the uh, pods on it, something like that. So what he, what he ultimately wants to do is he wants a restoration, but a period correct modification restoration. In other words, what this thing would look like and let's say 79 if somebody had it for a year and then they decided to uh, put you know a different header on it like a Kirker which is period correct and in the pods and do some jetting and maybe do a couple other small things all right somebody's already messed with it with some chrome here and there which he wants to get rid of wants to kind of go back into this chrome swing arm like what the hell is that all about so 
That's going to all get changed. He's going to do that through some other source. The only thing we're going to end up doing probably is taking it all apart eventually. But right now, again, this is just a baseline. We're going to establish a baseline, and we are going to figure out uh, where we need to go. So let's go ahead and get you set up in a stand. We'll get the tank off. Uh, we'll get an alternative fuel supply, some batteries, some juice, battery juice in there because it's battery shot, and we'll see what, see what we get from it. All right, that's pretty good. What we're gonna do here is this is already loose. There's a, you know, on these KZs, there's a uh, actual rubber band kind of gizmo that goes up and holds these tanks in place. That's already released down in there. So we can lift the back of the tank up. Now, normally I'd put some uh, padding up in here. So when you lever the tank forward like this, it won't hit and damage it. But this tank is pretty much scrap anyway. Uh, we are going to, uh, here. We are going to be putting a different tank on. A customer already has another tank. Uh, we're going to have to take the. Um, our, uh, there's two fuel outlets on this uh, petcock, just like the standard KZ1000. So we got to pop them off. And I don't know if this fuel cock is um, is leaking or bypassing or anything like that, but we'll have to figure that out as we go here. So we'll go ahead and get those off. The uh, tank has a sender in it, but it's disconnected already for a fuel gauge, so we'll deal with that another time, too. Should be able to pull this off now. Yes. All right. Set it down in a safe location. If you have sticky um, lines that are on, uh, you know, uh, nipples like that, you know, fuel nipples on petcocks and stuff, a little silicone spray will help immensely. Put that on there and just wiggle around a little bit of silicone kind of you know, leaks its, you know, kind of gets itself in there and the thing will just uh, come right off, no problem. So we've got, um, yeah, somebody's done some work here, that's for sure. Oh boy. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll have to deal with this later on, but all right, so <laughs> we got that off. Just do a quick overall evaluation. Um, I'm not sure why we have aftermarket uh, wires and stock coils. Those are definitely stock coils, so you got me. Um, I would think that they would want to put on some Dyna, Dyna asses or something. I'm not sure. I don't even know if this still has points or if it even ever did. I'll have to take a look at that. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure this had a points ignition. Not, uh, it's too early, I think, to have uh, any type of uh, electronic ignition, but uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. going down number one and uh, across the frame Japanese bike your cylinders and four cylinder starts number one to the left number two three and four so it's left to right there are other configurations in the V4 area of course that are a little different but and across the frame it's that way well, this looks kind of crappy, but I'm not too terribly um, surprised by it, to be honest with you. So either that's uh, fuel, oil, or both following pretty bad. Uh, these are the correct, well, B8ES would actually be, um, would actually be the correct plug. Now the way NGK does it, um, a lower number on an NGK plug is not a colder plug, it's actually a hotter plug. And that has a lot to do with the the uh, distance of the the uh, electrode, how much it either is in or sticks out of the actual body of the plug. You can look that up yourself. Go on the NGK website, they explain it all. But NGK is a little different. When the number goes down, it's a little hotter. So somebody's dropped a little hotter plug in here for obvious reasons, because it's probably running too rich. Or it just runs like crap. We're gonna put that plug here back in in a minute, but I just wanna take a look down. Cylinder, see what we got. Spark plug hole. Well, 
I can see the uh, exhaust valve for number one opened up because it's sitting in the open position. It doesn't look bad at all. The top of the cylinder looks about nominal. The uh, top of the piston, rather, pardon me. The top of the piston looks, uh, you know, pretty much carboned up like it would with modified carbs, jetted, things like that. They're, they're very often not jetted correctly. So. All right, well, we're going to put this back in as it sits because I want to see how this thing is running as it sits. The next thing we need to do is we're going to get some power on it, get my auxiliary fuel source set up, and then we'll take it from there. Let me get all that hooked up and I'll bring you back. All right, I got my fuel can hooked up, which is a true fuel can, just an old fuel can with a, you know, a tap on the bottom uh, and a shut off and a filter in line. And so we're ready to go. I got it hooked up to a, to a T. Fuel tees to populate both sides of the fuel inlet, one for number one and two, and num one for number two and three. Uh, I have the um, a power hooked up to the battery correctly this time. <laughs> I hooked it up to the I hooked it up over here. I thought that was directly to the battery, was to the starter. So we don't want that. We want to be able to actually use the starter button. So I got that straightened out. Um, although it did kick, so let's give it a shot again and see what happens. Uh-huh. Well, it sure as hell don't want to run with the uh, choke off, but it is pretty cold, obviously. I'm going to jack the uh, idle up right now. See if we can just keep it running. So she's burning oil. Well, you can see it and I can smell it. So we got, definitely got a problem in this engine. There's no question about it. What that is, who knows? Could be top end. Now you can see from the way this looks. I mean, it ran pretty good, but you know, we can't have it burning oil. So the way this top end of cylinder head looks is somebody's done a top end on this thing, especially when it's got a ping bowl uh, cam, you know, cap end, the, uh, the cutaways on top of the head where they actually go in and they line bore the, um, the cam, um, uh, you know, bearing surfaces for the actual cam on the top of the head. So, um, you know, somebody's been in here, obviously, and, and you can tell that. Now, as far as the main cylinder goes, I don't know, but uh, certainly on the head. But, yeah, that's definitely burning some oil. So what we need to do first is, um, is do a compression test on it and then uh, probably do a leak down on it. So uh, then we gotta get this off so we can crank the motor around. So uh, yeah, it runs, but um, let's try that again. See how it runs again, just for the hell of it. No, I don't wanna run at all.
Yeah, that's not fuel, boys and girls. That's um, definitely oil smoke. That's bluish oil smoke. Um, I can smell it as well. So this thing is definitely pushing some oil. All right, let's do that. We got we to get some testing done. I'm going to go ahead and pull the carb rack. I'm going to have to do it anyway. Um, we know it runs, but we know it smokes. So what the hell? We don't need to leave those on. But I always like to do a compression and a leak down test with the carbs off so I can put my head up right against the uh, intakes or my ear rather when I'm doing a leak down. And uh, there's no restriction on a compression test uh, with the carbs off. There's completely none. It's, it's, it's way better than even with the uh, throttle open. So uh, it gives me a little bit more of an accurate uh, measurement because if I we do some top end work and when we retest it, we'll retest it the same way and uh, we'll see the improvement there. Okie doke, we got the carbs off as you can see here. That's pretty easy to do. You loosen the band clamps, you pop them off, lay them there, take the cables off, fuel lines, you're done. So and if there's vacuum lines, you know, you watch out for whether those go down below. What I mean by not vacuum, but vent lines, in the carb vent line. So, all right, so uh, plugs are out. And I'll tell you what, this engine and the plug smells like oil. So this, this thing's definitely burning oil. But what's causing it? Is it compression rings? A blow by is it um, uh, is it uh, valve stem seals or just the oil control rings? I don't know. That's why we have to start testing. So we'll start with a compression test, as I said. And the engine is warm, somewhat warm at least, so it'll be a pretty good one. And we've got all the other plugs out. I hope this thing spins fast enough with my Zeus, the Zeus battery. We'll find out. Let's see what we got. If it doesn't, I'm gonna have to get another alternative uh, power source. Well, it ain't spinning very fast, so I'm going to have to change that, but yeah, uh, what is that, about 110 at that cranking speed? It is a little slow, though, so we'll have to uh, adjust that. I'm going to have to put a different unit on. I do have a different, uh, uh, you know, power jumper type thing. I'm going to get that on here in a minute. We'll try it again because i got to have somewhat more of an accurate reading than that. Damn, I'm tripping over myself. Okay, so i got to... Bitchin' power supply now on it. So let's see where we got with a, a better crank. Start from zero. Not good. Yeah, that's not good. Uh, number one is at 130, barely. 130 PSI. That is, that's it's not terrible, but it ain't good. Um, I would prefer it to be about 150 on this kind of bike. You know, 145, 150, 160 would be great. But, I mean, it's not terrible, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's not great. So, all right. Move over to number two. 135. 135. All right, here we are, number three. I'm sorry it's upside down, but I can't really stretch it around that far. But we can read it, nonetheless. Turn on some power, and we'll see what we got. That's a lot better, 140. So uh, number three is 140, 140 PSI. Okay, here we are, number four. See what we got. Man, just a skosh under 150. I don't know why number four is always the best on these bikes. Every stinking one that I work on that has some sort of compression problem, four is always the best, and I would say... I don't know why. It's across the frame inline four, everything's exposed to the same amount of heat and cooling. So I don't know, but that, that's where we want to be. I'm going to switch back to number one and recheck this one just to be sure uh, because um, that is a pretty significant variance. 130 to 150, we'd be out of our spec of 10% on that right there. Um, but um, what we're going to do is recheck that. We'll do a quick outro and then we'll close this video out. Okay, number one, final time. Yeah, we got the same, 130. Okay. All right, so so what does this mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. All right, so what do we know? We don't know a hell of a lot more than we did 20 minutes ago before we did that section of the, the compression test, that segment. Uh, but we do know we have uh, compression is probably within the spec for individual numbers for each cylinder, but they are definitely not when you compare the numbers between the two, between the four rather. 
Um, when we have we have 140 and 145, or I should say 145, 150 on three and four, and then much lower 130 and 135 down on one and two. Yeah, th that's a problem. Now the next video we're going to do because this one's already long enough, and I got a I got a hot lunch date anyway with a couple of guys, friends of mine. Don't go there. And uh, we're going to do in the next video to figure out what's going on by using a, a leak down test. And we'll see if we have um, some leaking past the unacceptable leakage, I should, I should say, past the rings, or if we have some top end uh, issues in regards to the valves. Uh, that'll at least diagnose the uh, compression, but it won't diagnose the oil consumption. But usually they go in tandem. So if we have uh, a leak down, we're showing um, a bypass of an unacceptable amount into the uh, cylinder block past the rings, there's your oil consumption problem. If we don't, then it might be in the valves. And then we can certainly have an oil consumption problem based upon some damage or wear to the valve stem seals. So stay tuned to the next video. Um, this one's already, as I said, long enough. We'll, we'll get to that here real soon. Thanks for coming back to the channel if you were a previous subscriber, and we'll catch you on the next one. Take care.